do you like books or movies or TV shows or songs with lyrics? You know, things that were created by writers. Of course you do. Do you like watching people type? I doubt it. Do you like hearing people tell you about how they came up with the things they type? Maybe. And there are lots of shows like that. But this isn't one of them. Do you ever procrastinate? Writers do too. So if you've ever enjoyed a great book or film or TV show or song or poem, and you thought, I'll bet the woman who wrote this epic high fantasy TV series, or the guy who wrote this funny queer sci-fi novel, or the person who writes this punch you in the gut poetry would be really fun to hang out with. And I'd like to hear them confess their bad not writing habits. You're in the right not writing place. I'm Benjamin Gorman, and the quiet guy behind the glass over there is Doug the producer. I write novels and collections of poetry and stuff, and Doug does his best to try to make me sound better. From Not A Pipe Publishing, welcome to Writers Not Writing. Today's secret word is ado. Perfect. Welcome, everyone. Our guest this week is Marin Bradley Anderson. Uh, Marin is a writer, editor, teacher, and alpaca rancher in Oregon. She is the emerita editor in chief of the Timberline Review, the managing editor of Pure Insights. She writes plays and is the executive producer of Apple Box Children's Theater. Her essays have appeared in various national publications, and her novels include Sparks, a paranormal romance, and Fuzzy Logic, an alpaca ranch romance. So as our regular uh, viewers and listeners know, uh, we really dress up for th this show. You know, we go all out and uh, that is great for the folks who are watching it on YouTube. You can see us in these, uh, you know, costumes today. But for the folks who are listening to the podcast, we want to make sure that we describe our cool costumes. So what did you choose to wear for the show today? Well, it wasn't much of a choice because, you know, as as you as you said, I have an alpaca farm. And so uh, once a year we have to we have to shear the, the wool off of them, the, the fiber off of them. And so, uh, yeah, we just got done doing that. So I have on my brown Carhartt overalls and my black barn coat, I've got my hat on because otherwise they'll spit in my hair. And and, and, I, and Evie doesn't probably shed a whole lot. But, you know, I look a like cousin it right now. I'm all covered in hair and but it's a cool look like you Thanks. know it's, it's a it's yeah and it looks soft well these are my going to these are my going to town overall yes, so yes. special you earned some stuff <laughs> well i went the exact opposite direction no hair at all so i got this pleather cat suit uh off off of youtube or i mean off of amazon and uh it is it's quite tight uh but uh you know very very uh shimmery and uh and you know full on uh no hair visible uh smooth so so we've kind of got the the two textures so for the folks I, who are watching on uh on youtube this is i do know. have to say it's a statement piece <laughs> exactly well and last week i went with the mankini and that was a little much for some folks they were like that's, that's you know so this is more coverage but it's very shimmery and uh and so you know i i thought folks might like that in you know in contrast to the uh alpaca hair so that's that was that was the the thinking there so you know we, we listeners we uh we 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 have you in mind we we, we come prepared so uh this this week what have you been what's been keeping you from your writing it's a show about procrastination as authors you know we could talk all day about what we write but instead what keeps us from our writing so this week what kind of pop culture is keeping you away from your writing well, we, uh, I have a couple of kids and they, um, they tell us what to watch because they have much better, a much better uh, grasp on pop culture than we do. And uh, my uh, older kid decided that we had to watch Wednesday and I have to say she was right. That was a good show. It was right there in my wheelhouse because the Adams Family is, it's a great franchise. It's so awesome. And um, Wednesday is a character that should have been developed even more, even from the movies. And and this character, the way they did her, she's so Daria, and I was all Daria all the time. Oh yeah, we were watching it. So, um, yeah, and it was a cute, cute mystery too. Um, and they left a left enough 
um, unanswered questions that there's probably going to be a season two given the buzz. So I'm excited about that one. That one was really, really nice. I liked that. And I have been hearing about it from my students, from colleagues. So I, that's one that I know that I need to check out. Uh, it's, it, it sounds right up my alley as well. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Yeah, that well, and even like, you know, th they were very clever, put a dance in it that everybody wants to do. And then it goes nuts and goes, you know, tick I'm so I've, I have seen so many versions of the 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 Wednesday dance on TikTok. Uh, Before and we started watching it, that was the only thing my husband had seen online was the yeah. Wednesday dance. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, what, 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 what is this? And people did some really clever things with it. And I was like, okay, this, I'm going to have to check this out. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I'm glad to hear that there is a larger through line than just, you know, uh, uh, vignettes of, you know, Wednesday being weird, uh, you know, cause you're right. She's a great character and I want more of why, why is Wednesday the way Wednesday is so that I'll have to check that out. Yeah. I, it, and she, reminds me a lot of characters that I not only just like to watch, but that I like to write too. There's a little bit of a rebellious streak in a whole bunch of us, um, especially um, people who grew up in the 90s who just are so sick of everybody else's stuff. Yeah. <laughs> we just really love to just disengage. Yes. And so <laughs> seeing a character spend her time disengaging the whole time. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's... <laughs> And um, my dog, Evie, is the one making some of those bizarre noises. So for folks who are wondering, Evie wanted to contribute to the show. And Doug, I don't know if there's anything. Yeah, Doug is shaking his head. There's probably no way to uh, to to cut the, the... It wasn't even like a snoring. It was a bizarre kind of snorting noise that Evie yeah. was, you know, wanting to, to let us all know that she was in on that. But uh, well, thanks, Evie. My, uh, contribution. my assistant editor, assistant teacher, assistant writer, Carl, will make an appointment here as soon as he realizes that I'm in here making, you know, talking to my Yes, screen. exactly. Inevitably. Um, and I will silence here. I think I'm silenced. But um, Can... so what about in the news? What's been keeping you from your writing in the news this week? <laughs> oh. Well, um, I, I put, yeah, uh, uh, so the thing I'm trying to avoid right now, but is really kind of sucking me in, is that um, criminal justice PhD student who was arrested for murdering the kids uh, in Idaho. Oh, that was horrible. It's horrifying. It's horrible. But as soon as I heard he was a criminal justice student, I'm like, oh, crap, he was trying to get away with murder like the TV right. show. And I I'm probably going to follow that all, all the way down the rabbit hole because I don't think I can avoid it. Um, and and was I, from what? Was it Indianapolis or something? Like he traveled across the country? Pennsylvania. Well, yeah, he went to school in Pennsylvania. I already see I'm trying to avoid it. But right. But it, no, it's too juicy. Even it's a train yeah. wreck. You know, no, he he went to school, got a got a master's degree, I think it was in Pennsylvania. His father lives there. And so he started a Ph.D in uh, the University of Washington, uh, the, the Western campus, which is 10 miles from Moscow, Idaho, where that, okay. uh, where the, where the, the murders happened. They're just across the, I have a friend that works in, in the Moscow campus. Um, and yeah, uh, he, so he'd been over there for a couple of months, you know, because he started his PhD and was teaching classes. And he actually, after the murders, they say that he stayed there and graded papers. <laughs> oh my gosh. And then he went home for Christmas. He drove home for yeah. Christmas. And that's where they found him in Pennsylvania. So and did he know the victims? I don't know. I mean, I presume I know. that he, you know, must have had some relationship to the victims. And at the same time, like if you want to perform the perfect murder, don't harm anyone you actually know, then there's that many more connections. And yeah, he so, did shit, uh, like he did stuff, sorry, uh, like turn off his cell phone when he went. I, you know, there's this blank spot from um, so that they couldn't track where his cell phone was and then he turned it on again and but they uh, it's so yeah I'm trying real hard not to follow that and I'm failing apparently you know badly. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's that's a wild story I was in Pennsylvania when they uh, when they captured him so it was in the local news hey you oh know, local boy does bad <laughs> like kind of a story and I that was my first exposure to it and I was like I don't understand the murders are in Idaho what's going on and now it's as you know it's all coming together it's like this is a wild nationwide kind of story <laughs> like yeah yes yeah. and that's the kind of thing that I usually just try to avoid and dive into some other something else but um, there's another one that caught my attention that was from uh, just before Christmas, I think it was, the New York Times ran a profile 
of this guy in New York City um, who is a recovering addict and is a you know in the system and he they've they've got him an apartment in Times Square and he sees uh, court mandated uh, psych psychologists and you know he's he's in the system he's being taken care of but he's compelled to call nine one one and report these heinous crimes that are not happening at a building that doesn't exist. Wow and boy does that open a whole bunch of interesting possibilities for writing stories i right? mean yeah that's <laughs> as a writer my you know the gears are turning where i'm like wow what if he's tapping into something else that mm -hmm. you know the, the, the parallel dimension where those crimes are occurring in the building that actually exists there like that's really fascinating yeah yeah, so, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a very strange compulsion yeah and he's just this you know, everyone who meets him is like, yeah, he's just this nice guy who's just doing his thing. And he's this older gentleman. And but eh, there's a certain times of night he had and he does it like several times a day. The thing is, is that since it's an address that does not exist, right? they're able to screen the calls mostly. Yeah, they can just go, OK, don't dispatch. You know, he's not harming anybody in that way. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, I hope somebody's writing them down. Yeah. Like record these. These are these are gold. <laughs> gold. Just oh, my God, it's a murder mystery in time dimension series at this point yeah. and I said that's fascinating to me and I pick things like that out of the news all the time um yeah yeah you, it's stranger than fiction kind of thing right <laughs> um Dostoevsky that was his part of his process was he would read these stories in the newspaper and go there's a potential you know and so I know crime and punishment was a, a local murder case that he then you know said oh I'm going to fictionalize this so I, did not I think know there that. are a lot of murder writers who are like oh yeah let's you know you know kind of, kind of predates true crime you know like let's uh let's let's take a story and fictionalize it and have fun with it but that one's that one's more fun because there's a kind of innocence to it like you're not telling about some real family's tragedy you're telling about this guy's delusion which may exist in a parallel dimension. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that, that can be really fun. Yeah, the, the journalist who wrote it um, in the last two or three sentences uh, gives a theory that possibly in his mind by reporting these things, he's a hero Yeah, and he's finally in control of something in his life or something like that. Yeah, and it gives him some power and some sense that he's helping the world and some something. purpose. Uh, yeah. That's but, it. But I like the time dimension idea a whole lot better, you know. Yeah, yeah, we get to play with that side, whereas, yeah, the the you know the psychological definition is still interesting. Like, what is it this guy needs? How is this meeting a need of his? Is that the major difference between um, between genre and literary fiction? You and yeah. I are like, oh, we could do time stuff, and a yes, literary exactly. person would be we like, oh, yes, but we're the not bound stuff. by you know, oh, this has to be uh, you know an in-depth exploration of this person's inner psychology. Like, no, let's explain it with the setting. This there's got to be a dragon. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Somewhere there's a, there's yes there's a dragon. There's there's a monster involved. Uh, which yeah, that that I I think that's so much more fun to read. <laughs> so, um, well, for me this last week certainly it's been the uh, Kevin McCarthy speakership debacle, which has been alternatingly you know, hilarious, like from a, a kind of Schoedenfrada perspective where you're just going, this is a mess of his own creation. Like here is a person who enabled the most chaotic, I call them the chaos gremlins of the party and, and said, it's okay for you to do everything you can for attention. Uh, I'll never hold you accountable for that. I promise. And then he ends up being held hostage by them. Uh, and, you know, there there was no way to motivate them because they made it very clear they're just doing the things they do for attention. Well, how do you wrangle those folks at that point? You can't make concessions like there's no way to negotiate in good faith. And, and kind of one of the arguments for years has been, you know, the, the Democrats saying we can't negotiate with you in good faith and, and Republicans saying, oh, no, no, don't worry, we'll keep our promises. And now they're dealing with it internally. So that was uh, that was fun to watch and at the same time like genuinely a, a concern like if the house can't do any business it can't pass a budget it can't raise the debt ceiling it can't you know and so i was going this is all funny till it's not funny and this could be really bad so they did get it all passed as of this morning uh he's the speaker but if you get a chance i encourage all the listeners out there hakeem jeffries then gives a speech in which he uh it's it's organized around the alphabet and it is brilliant. It oh, is. Oh my gosh! Yeah, uh, you know, M is for maturity over Mar-a-Lago. Uh, <laughs> Q is for uh, 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 
you know, I can't remember what the, the original Q was, uh, you know, quality leadership over QAnon. Like the whole thing is the the alphabet and it is, it's it's fire. So absolutely uh-huh. check it out. Um, Lord knows total... he had several days to write it. So. Yeah, he had the time. I mean, he must have just been sitting there going, oh my gosh, what am I, you know, he's like counting like, you know, stuff in the filigree in Congress ceiling. And he's like, I could write an alphabet book. He probably wrote multiple. The guy's brilliant too. I mean, you yeah, hear yeah, the yeah. speech and you're like, his a person, you know, there, there's so much brain power in that room. Uh, you know, th- there's a great shot of, uh, um, what is the, um, the Congresswoman from Orange County who always used the whiteboard. Uh, yeah, I don't remember her name, but yeah. yeah uh, and she's, you know, reading this book about, uh, you can, you know, she's ostentatiously holding up the cover and it's something about, you know, uh, how not to give an F about what's going on. Like <laughs> she's just sitting there pouring through this book. <laughs> Let me so, tell yeah. you my favorite part of this whole thing. Okay. So during um, when Congress is in session, C-SPAN's on, right? But C-SPAN has an agreement with whatever power whatever party's in power about where they can point the cameras. It must be some contractual thing. Well, no one was in charge, so they pointed the cameras wherever they wanted. We saw everybody talking with everybody else and making deals. And that one guy was like lunging for for, uh, Gates, I guess it was, and there were Ah. people holding him back. And I'm like, ooh, C-SPAN's cool right now. Yeah, people were saying C-SPAN's never gonna have ratings like this ever again. Like it was, yeah, there was nearly a full-on fight on the House floor, which has not happened since the run-up to the Civil War. Like this is, bonker stuff uh and uh so yeah watching it was like this is i mean you know again watching a train wreck uh this shouldn't be happening and yet i cannot look away so that that certainly was you know and just the sheer number of votes i kept going oh and now we're at seven and now we're at 13 and now you know like the number of votes that it took and at every turn he was making these concessions with people who did not care about the concessions really uh, and so I was like, wow, he is now officially made himself the weakest speaker in the history of speakers in negotiating with people who don't care about any of the real you know, concessions that he made. And so watching that was hilarious. And also we are in for a wild couple of years in the House where every single time any individual gets frustrated, they can call for that again. And we could have it another you know, week or two of votes. So this will be uh, it will it will be entertaining but also it's important for me to remind myself like it's not just entertaining this will have real consequences in people's lives if they're planning a trip to you know yosemite and yosemite is closed by the time they arrive because somebody called for a vote on the speaker and suddenly they can't pass a budget you know i mean this is you know basic governance stuff that they are going to not be able to accomplish so it's it's funny till it's not but uh in the meantime i i got took a lot of joy from it (laughs) it was very amusing not a yeah a little um yeah exactly yeah (laughs) so how about hobbies what is something that you've been doing this last week uh that has been pulling you away from your writing let's see um uh so i uh, i knit and um i should have grabbed a thing that i knit but whatever just take my word for it um i knit because i watch football and uh so uh, having good Midwestern Protestant stock in me, I can't waste <laughs> my time watching football. I have Just to one make thing something. At a time. Right. We have to be doing 10,000 things at a time. Yeah. So I've made two big fluffy hats. Um, I've got this alpaca blend yarn. It's really nice. And uh, made one for myself. And my daughter was like, ooh. And I'm like, I'll make you one. Leave my hat alone. Yeah. Um, Were you watching the game on Monday, the Bills Bengals game? I was not. Uh, I, I saw the video after the fact. That was scary. That was scary. It's a, it's a thing that just happens. Um, if if it if it is what it what it looks like, which is you know, an impact at the at the one twentieth of a second, exact yeah. time can can defibrillate a heart. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was it was really I, scary. I mean, he stands back up and he's kind of triumphant. You know, I, yeah. I, I achieved this hit and then just goes back arms out and you're watching it and yeah i was like and for years they've been saying there will come a time when someone dies on the field and the NFL. oh people die on the field all the time it happens uh, in, in middle school it happens in high school more often uh you yep, know young college. people's bodies you know and and so the fear was this is going to get it on the attention and the radar of a lot of parents mm-hmm. that their kids are being put in this kind of danger uh and uh and then to yeah. see it happen, I was like, we we might be watching, you know, a, a snuff film on national television. Like, this is really scary. Uh, it's 
I have a love hate relationship with football. I a hundred percent do. I, um, I've been watching it since I was a little kid and I love watching it and I can kind of explain it to you. There's something about the narrative and the poetry and this, the, the, um, the athleticism of the guys is just really, really, um, compelling. And, um, but morally, uh, it's terrible. It's terrible on so many different yeah. fronts. And, um, a couple of years ago, I almost stopped watching it um, because the con the concussion um, thing got so awful. Yeah. Um, and but then they pulled me back in. But you know what? You know what I have been doing? I have been substituting it with another sport. Oh, what's that? That's sumo. Oh, really? <laughs> and the next sumo um, starts. The next sumo tournament starts um, this Sunday, I think. Maybe next Sunday. Next Sunday. And it's got a lot of the same things. It's got the narratives. It's got the big athletic guys. It's a one-on-one -on -one sport. Um, it's all year long. So soon, you know, uh, they have one every, a tournament every two months. And uh, my husband spent some time in Japan, so uh, he, you know, he kind of likes watching sumo. And then we started watching sumo together. And now I'm like, yeah, sumo. That might scratch enough of this itch that I can finally disentangle myself from football. That is um, great. So I can knit during sumo instead. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I'm a big NBA fan and the idea of not having an off season appeals. Cause let me tell you when I am, uh, you know, when, when the NBA season is off, I am jonesing. Like, I'm like I, I've become one of those people who's like listening to podcasts and going, what are the trade rumors and stuff? And I'm like, what am I doing? Like this, know. <laughs> you know, a huge chunk of swath of my life. But I used to be really into uh, NFL football. The other thing that is you know, I think totally valid and true for a lot of folks is it's family. Like you're getting together. And for me, it was my brother and I would be talking on the I. phone, you know, every mm -hmm. week. Did you see this? Da, 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 da. And so that was really cool. Uh, but I, I got to that point where I was going, I can't follow this in the same way. I feel really conflicted. It makes me uncomfortable when I'm watching it because I know a couple of things, you know, the, the, the guy's behavior itself off the field was often, you know, really reprehensible, but also mm -hmm. the, the idea that these guys were sacrificing their potentially sacrificing their lives. Mm -hmm. And there's one of the things that was disturbing to me about it is the, the kind of racial element. Yeah. This is a large group of largely black men sacrificing their bodies for white men who are literally called owners. Yeah. And that's just like, oh so gross to me and i was just like i i just can't anymore i just feel so gross you know encouraging this whereas like in the nba the players union is far more powerful the players are far more well compensated they are you know they have a lot more influence over their own safety mm -hmm. uh and so that's one of the things that i like to see this is a yeah. a, a workers league uh and uh and, you know the, the coaches and owners don't have uh, nearly, although the, those owners are so incredibly wealthy. The guy who owns um, the Toronto Raptors is one of these, you know, Russian oligarch money guys. And he makes so much money that he can pay for one of their contracts in an hour. He makes like $400 million a day. Like it's not, I mean, the amounts of money are just obscene. They're incomprehensible to me, but, uh, yeah. but uh, you to be know, honest, sumo is not a whole lot better than football it might even be worse because of the, the stables that they have, they I, have I read about this so yeah. that, and there is some kind of grossness in terms of the way sometimes that but it's not wwe fakery but at the same time there were some people taking dives for money right oh god yeah oh, no no it's a uh, hundred percent the freaking the first freakonomics books did um yes that's where economic, I yeah economic study and no there's a hundred percent there's some there's some shady stuff going on but no the stables you join a stable when you're a teenager and they basically own you mm. it, <laughs> and it's it sometimes it's real bad yeah. um but um but <sighs> You know how you're not supposed to meet your heroes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not supposed to truly understand the system. Once you, you know, really look at the system, you're like, oh, this is no longer so fun. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I like cooking. <laughs> yes. Well, and the knitting. Like, at least you can go, okay, I felt conflicted about this, but look what I produced. This is really cool, you know? So uh, that, that it, it is good to have something else that you are doing at the same time so you can feel constructive. Right, exactly. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then... Uh, besides the uh the the football and the knitting mm -hmm. uh you've got the tell everybody about the theater because this is really cool oh you like the theater yeah so um 
uh, I can go back deep history, but let's just, let's do it really con uh, condensed. So back in the 70s, somebody started a little children's theater on, on Western campus, Western Oregon University, where I teach, um, a little children's theater. And um, that went for 20 years or so until the guy retired. And then about 10 years ago, uh, Rob Harriman and his wife, Barb Harriman, um, started it up again just because they're like we were he was in it when he was a little kid and he's like yeah let's just start this little th kid theater up again it was so they're good really for neat people too so that's cool oh they're awesome they are so freaking awesome and so they did and um a couple year and um they had the first year they had me make a poster for them which was nice because i have uh that much skill and talent when it comes but they needed someone and then a couple years later uh my kids were old enough that that we put them in and I think Colleen um, was a sheep in the Odyssey. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and um, one uh, 2014, Barb sidles up to me during performance and said, you should write a play for us. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and, How many have you written then, now? Five. Yeah, so I thought it was a lot. Yeah. 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 So what I did what the first year was I adapted Midsummer's Night's Dream for them, for the kids. I saw that and, one. You did. It's oh, it yeah. was so much fun, and because the whole shtick that they were aiming for was big stories, little people. Yep. So I'm like, can I adapt to Shakespeare? They're like, sure. So I adapted it with the theory that I can make the language more accessible to them, mm -hmm. and um, and the story of Midsummer's Night's Dream is all fairies and people turning into yeah. animals, and and okay, there's some lovey stuff, but you know, kids are like, ew, girls, or ew, boys, but right. it wasn't so overt, right? It was mostly them running around in the woods looking for each other, um, and they loved it, and yeah. they, it was great, um, and so then, then a couple years later, I did, next one I did was Aladdin, no, I it wasn't Aladdin, was it was well. Aladdin, my son to that one, yeah, 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 and that one was great, I oh, got to play so the fun. Easter egg of that story, and then I did, um, which, what did I do next? Um, I did, I've done Beowulf and I did um, uh, Much Ado About Nothing. This last year I did um, St. George and the Dragon. So I'm a playwright for them, right? Yeah. And I um, now I'm- We missed as a family because we would be like on vacation and we would be like, oh no, we wanted to see that one. <laughs> I've got a whole really bunch of them on my website and you can go and look and watch a whole bunch of them, so. Well, and I was wondering, do you do, do you make the scripts available to other small groups? Because I, uh, yep. you know, kids groups, because that, that's, the, they're really fun shows. Like they, Thank you know, you. They're, they're fun for adults too. I've enjoyed them. So uh, yeah, uh, they're available. Great. People can write me. I am, cr I am crap at, <laughs> at um, the, pursuing at, at, at the, the stuff that happens after right of 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 um after the writing of things i um don't uh i haven't figured out how to make those available i think what i'm going to do is actually slap a whole bunch of the scripts together in a big old book oh, and make nice. that available um so that people can and then if people want to license it they can write me and i can we'll, we'll do a license yeah. thing. Right. Uh, but yeah how 100 percent people are you know can can um, ask me to to do that i just haven't i haven't been very public about it well anybody watching listening if you need a script for your local children's theater group they are really fun so oh, that would be uh, maybe somebody out there will go oh yeah we should do that here in wherever that. they're listening so yeah i encourage listeners uh the, 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 the it's a great resource to have those scripts available oh, there yeah so the uh, other part of it is that rob and barb retired <laughs> and um, i was like no somebody has to perform my script so I took over <laughs> and um but then um I also knew that I wasn't going to be a director I I've done a little acting but I tell people I'm like Robin Williams and all characters that Robin Williams played were Robin Williams and they're yeah. so yeah I could go up on like on stage and and say words but they're me um so I'm not directing I don't want to do that I can't do that I want to learn that it's not my skill set so I needed I needed um someone to do that on a regular basis basis um i also wanted to formalize i also did not want to be a 403 b or c whatever i don't care it's, it's a tax thing i don't want to be a nonprofit. i don't want to do the the math of the paperwork so i connected um western oregon university's foundation i connected the uh the this uh what does cte stand for um, uh career and technical education right career technical education program at um central high school oh. and um all three, and then I'm also bringing in the uh, the city too, um, as this conglomeration of support for this children's theater, oh, and that's, that's worked out really well. That's been really awesome. And this year we've got a, 
if people want to send us money, we are doing a campaign to get some better microphones and speakers so that people can hear the kids. And, and there's a great space for it too. That's nice mm -hmm. that the city has helped on that. And so uh, it's not it's on the college campus, actually. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, that's uh, yeah. The Western has been a, a partner, and that's been wonderful. And yeah, it's um, been awesome. But, yeah, I'm glad you're, you know, finding different people with different skill sets who can, you know, contribute in that way is so vital because, uh, yeah, when you, you know, try and do it all, uh, it, yeah, I, I, I feel this uh, intimately. <laughs> trying to, I'm learning to go, I need to hire this person to do this. I need to bring in other people to do these things because if I try and do all the parts, I am not as good at them uh, at yeah. a lot of the different aspects. It's so, so hard because I could be, you know, if I just applied myself a little bit, you know, you, no, and it's there's not enough hours in the day. Get someone who can actually do it right. Delegation. Yeah, well, speaking of things I am not good at, you are a great cook. I well, yeah, I am a terrible, ter notoriously uh, a terrible cook. So tell everybody about what you've been cooking lately. Uh, uh, I mostly I just cook dinner for the family, but for Thanksgiving, um, I cooked one of the turkeys our kids raised because they do 4-H. And there's this whole market program in 4-H that most people don't know about, but our kids um, raised tur little turkeys from uh, chicks, and then they went to uh, the fair and they auctioned them off and they got a crap load of money for turkeys. It's, oh, yeah. It's it's awesome for, for us. But we ended up with extra turkeys because you just don't buy one turkey because the damn things just die for no reason. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we ended up with three extra turkeys, okay? Um, and it took me a while to find a turkey butcher, which um, is a weird set of sentences to say, but it did. Right. So these turkeys that we had, the three extras, lived an extra month. Okay, so they were market weight, and then they lived an extra month. So uh, when I got them back from the butchers, I had two 25 pound turkeys. All right, one of which I'd already sold. So I cooked a 25 pound per turkey for Thanksgiving. That's a whole story. The other turkey was 40 pounds which is, is enormous it's as somewhat as the person i gave it to says it's half of an emu yeah, yeah. <laughs> and this is dress <laughs> this isn't like with guts and feathers this is 40 pounds of turkey meat and bone Just and the meat. It, ridiculous it is so huge fortunately we have a chest freezer i was gonna say yeah you need to like there's no yeah. you know a, a chest freezer with a lot of space in it that is not full of everything i mean i have a chest freezer that's full of like you know uh, ice for an emergency kind of thing yeah this, this we took is, all that out yeah. you know, a lot of meat <laughs> that's a ton so the question is what do you do with a 40 pound turkey because it yeah. was not fitting in my oven and I didn't really think this question all the way through before I put it in the freezer. So then what do you do with a rock hard frozen 40 pound turkey? <laughs> um, and I couldn't actually just kind of sell it because it was not done in a, F, in a, in a um, um, not FDA. Yeah, FDA, uh, an approved um, uh, um, place where you can, a commercial butcher. Um, so I've tried, it took me forever, but I found a place that would take it, a, a place that, um, uh, uh, it's a club and it provides uh, a holiday meal for people who can't go home for one reason or another, right? Um, and that guy had access to a uh, commercial kitchen at the Salvation Army, right? Which was perfect because you needed something right. gigantic. Well, even then, the story comes back to me that they needed to cut it in half um, before they could. They <laughs> needed an oven. <laughs> and these guys were like, okay, well, well, what do we use? And I know I spatch cocked my my turkey, which means that I cut the spine out and, and made it flat. Which and is something I just learned about a few years ago, and I love that term. Spatch Isn't that word the best? Inherently hilarious. <laughs> yes. Well, it meant sawing out the spine, and sawing is the word for it. I got my biggest, toothiest bread knife, and I just you know hacked at it for like half an hour. It was it was epic. And so these guys decided to saw it in half. And the first guy was like, "Well, let's use a chainsaw." <laughs> oh my gosh! I wish they'd videoed that. They, they decided not to do it because they realized there's bar oil on the chain. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. That might it's make not sanitary, crazy. but it'd be uh, amazing to watch. So they used a Sawzall instead. <laughs> and I will have to ask if they have video of it because I want to see it. You just, just... <laughs> oh, yeah. Sawzall's a good, that's a good solution. That's it's a good solution. <laughs> like, you know, this will go through drywall and, you know, you can use this on good hard lumber. We can It'll go through some nails. Yeah, that's what you need. <laughs> so. Wow. 
so, so that's they, the the you left the uh, all that with the um the, the uh, facility itself for them to have you know 40 pounds of turkey meat yeah they eventually ate it all too they said that uh they had a uh, lot of because they serve a couple hundred people and that's yeah. what you need a 40 pound turkey for <laughs> yeah, that's great but yeah that's yeah. that's a lot well and that's cool for your kids too to know that they yeah. contributed in that way so yeah and that's sort of the thought. Cool. we're going to donate at least um, one of our extra turkeys um every year to to probably that that club again so yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's I've had kids who've done uh, for 4-H, they've raised pigs mm -hmm. and you can make good money raising yeah. pigs. But like you said, I mean, if your pig passes away in the process, you've invested a lot of money and time. And, you know, so there's know. that risk involved, which is a, a good thing for students to learn about, too. Like this mm -hmm. is not a, you know, a done deal, but uh, it's and it's a lot of work. But boy, if it uh, pays off, it pays off big because a baby yeah. piglet does not cost much. And a, you know thousand pound pig can bring in a lot of money uh, at auction it is bananas how much money they can get which is it's great because people use it as a tax write-off because it it goes to the 4-h people who take a cut and then the rest goes to the kids oh nice so, so that's one reason that the prices are so high because it's it's a it's a um it's ta has to do with taxes smart but, yeah but yeah so so in addition to the turkeys, uh, you were talking about your skill sets. Another entire skill set is farming. So what yeah. what what all has been going on on the farm? It's um, uh, we've lived here on this piece of property for 17 years now, which it boggles the mind, um, boggles the mind. <laughs> we have um, uh, had uh, alpacas the whole time and uh the short version of the alpaca story is that we were casting about, it's like, well, if we're going to get land, which we'd already decided we should do something with it, what should we do with it? And uh, my husband said, well, llamas are cute. And when we realized that alpacas are cuter and <laughs> littler. And, yeah. and if we were a business, we could write off improvements to the spare piece of land that we have. Yeah. So we were, um, uh, we've been in an alpaca business for like 17 years and, and we're, we're backing off of it now because we have, everything else is going on and um uh, all these other you know, kids and whatnot so uh but they it's they've been really good to us so they're they're an adorable little starter livestock which is kind of ironic because both my husband's mother and my mother grew up on actual farms and when, when we announced that we bought some property and we're going to start a ranch they were like why <laughs> I got out of there as soon as i could why are you going back how many did you have at the highest number? Uh, our our peak, we had 24. And, and now we're down to five. Yeah. We had one, our, one of our first original um, old ladies finally died. She was t 23, yeah. which is pretty much the maximum uh, age for an alpaca. Yeah. And then when, when you were at 24, how does that, I mean, when, you know, without getting into the, the, the uh, tiny details, but how does that do it's in terms of, the the value of all of that wool mm. well if you are um a person who uh doesn't mind having another part-time job you can <laughs> oh this was part of the problem right <laughs> so right i'm already busy but people who go to farmers markets and um they can sell the wool for about three dollars an ounce and you get four or five pounds off of our alpacas anyway some alpacas get more um you can send them off, send the wool off to be processed at small wheels and get back, mills and get back like yarn, which you sell for more than you would the unprocessed. And uh, of course, you put more into it. And then, you know, the more um, uh, that we had co-ops for uh, wool, for the yarn, uh, not for the for the wool, and um, and you get back products based on how much and all of these things. So there, there was a, a pretty good industry going on there um, for that kind of thing. But you needed to be able to uh have a shop and sell uh that that merchandise and i you know we're kind of out in the middle of nowhere and i just have never had the energy to have that extra layer of job yeah, I really you've got it. multiple I jobs think, yeah i know <laughs> i like to be busy but um there's a limit but i finally found a guy um these guys who uh come by and just buy all my all my wool and they take it away and um and they send me a check when they graded nice. and all that fun stuff yeah. oh that's great it's yeah, really that's, nice that's yeah. the way um, to go it's not 
the maximum that I could get for the the wool, but I'm not at that point anymore. Where we are not, well, Crystal um, and I have been saying a lot over the last few weeks, you know, s- stress is worth money. Like if you can de-stress yourself with, uh, uh, you know, this choice or that choice at some cost, that's, there are times when that is worth it. <laughs> like we'll, we'll pay the difference. We were uh, in Times Square for, uh, for New Year's Eve and that was, you know, an amazing experience, but yeah. uh, we were going to be standing in a line with no access to bathrooms for about 13 hours. And we were watching over the fence, uh, the, the police are kind of cordoning off like a eight block area. And some people were just walking up to the fence and going in. And so we, you know, did a little uh, uh, snooping and found out if we had a hotel room within that eight block radius, we could just go in. Oh. And so the hotels are not inexpensive on New Year's Eve uh, in that. But Crystal was like, it's worth it to me, like to not have to stand here for 13 hours with no bathroom. I will pay the difference. So on our phone, got a hotel room. We went right in and we could take naps. We went to a nice New York deli and got some dinner, <laughs> you know, uh, had access to a bathroom all day. And then in the evening, stepped out of the hotel and we were right there. And, and so it was, you know, and it was like, I'm, you know, I'm you know that kind of uh we were talking about the midwest you know protestant tradition i'm going this is very expensive ah and she's going it's worth it it is worth the 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 stress uh and so you know for a special occasion yes we will pay to to, uh to not have to deal with the the stress and strain we had four kids with us too four kids no bathrooms that was going to be it was going to be a rough uh that would have been a long sucky day long day yeah and instead <laughs> it was awesome it was, it was seeing cool. their faces when the ball dropped made it all worthwhile so excellent so in addition to the alpacas you've got other animals there on the farm you've got yeah, chickens do. uh donkey yeah. horse uh how's that all played out uh, i've had chickens even before we had alpacas because chickens are hilarious i love chickens they're just <laughs> They are the best, and I like eggs too. So, um, God, I can't even add how many ch- add up how many chickens we've had over the years. Uh, um, to the point where we kind of give them names anymore, but not anyway. But my my um, kids have decided they like to breed chickens, and so we keep getting more chickens. And now we have roosters, and we have we have three roosters right now, um, and. Uh, which is fine, you know, it's fine with me. It's just what the the country sounds like, right? right. Um, so we got chickens all over the place and most of our building projects have to do with chickens and there's chicken shows and chickens. Um, <laughs> at least it's chickens. I mean, maybe we have a horse, right? He's a 22, 20. I don't know he's an old horse and he's great. At least yeah. she didn't decide that she wanted to breed horses. You know? <laughs> because horses are a ton of work and expensive. It can be, yeah. Not not the way we keep him. He's he's backyard horse. He's got himself a, a shed and we feed him the food and he's got a blanket for when it's cold, you know, and he's filthy. He's this white horse and he rolls around in the mud and he's like four different colors, right? He's and just a happy horse not a he's a happy horse horse. yeah yeah that's great there's a whole long stories about buying the horse but we lucked out um because he was he's just a bomb you can't say bomb proof because no horse is bomb proof but he's as near as you can get and before him we ended up with two donkeys um one of them finally died she was like 30 years old though and the other donkey jack and 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 the horse are are buddies and donkeys yeah. are hilarious too oh my god yeah. they're so much fun so um keeps us it keeps us off the street we kind of we're a, <laughs> with the, there's always something to do on the farm yeah, yeah. so like, what do you do this week it's like well i could do this or this or this or this or this or this or this, or this. um it, it gives us something to putter it gives us the critters it gives us an excuse to live out here in this beautiful um um landscape that we have um because uh i'm kind of a misanthrope i (laughs) hide it really well but i got mad because i could hear my neighbor's wind chimes it's like i'm pretending i'm alone out here yeah it well and i can't i don't know that i have the powers to describe it but you're i I have been out to your place it is beautiful the way you come up that rise and you've got you can see the you know the treetops and you're on that hill it's it is a gorgeous place yeah we we got lucky um and we found a, a good place and up here and we were able to afford it and uh we built it just the way we like and yeah we're this is 
uh, this is our little piece of heaven and I'm um, uh, expecting to like leave it in a pine box feet first. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. No way. <laughs> yeah, you never leave that. <laughs> yeah. So it's really gorgeous out here and having all the critters together is uh, sort of a thing that's always been part of our plan as a couple. Um, and um, uh, the, the story goes is that um, no two months into dating my husband Charles, I looked at him and I said, okay, because I was done dating. You've ever you been there like where you're just uh -huh. like, I have dated for so long and <laughs> I'm just, I have a list here and let's check some things off. And I said, so let's play a game. Let's pretend we are still together in five years. Where are we and what are we doing? <laughs> and he's like, hmm, well, we're somewhere out in the country and we have a barn full of cats. We lived in Berkeley at the time. And I was like, I did not know that was the right answer, but that is the right answer. Yep. <laughs> yes. On my first date with Crystal, I made some reference to, you know, how geeky it was that someday I wanted to own a castle. And I did not realize that was like the correct answer because <laughs> her dream is to like, you know, she loves uh, like Regency era yeah. kind of Gothic, uh, you know, novels. And she was like, wait, I could be like wandering through the castle in like the, the long bathrobe. Yes. With a candlestick. And I was like. <laughs> Oh yeah, that that sounds good. And she was like, "Done." Like, <laughs> it was, finding the, the the person who thinks your weirdest nerdiest uh, uh, dream is theirs as well. Like, that's it's no easy task. But once you find that person, hold on. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, well, we should take a quick ad break. Uh, and so, Doug, get that all fired up. And uh, but uh, thank you all, and we'll be back in a moment. This week's show is brought to you by Lamageddon, the sustainably made all wool clothing you need to be wearing to be fashionable and warm when the four horsemen ride and the world comes to a bloody, poxy, famished, deadly end. Sure, Lamageddon clothes won't keep you alive through the end of all things, but in those last gasping minutes of the universe, don't you want to feel comforted and warm but not too warm? Who knows if you'll be consumed by ice or fire? Either way, llama wool is what you want to be wearing when it all goes tits up. So order your Llamageddon designer wear today. Llamageddon. It's the softest apocalypse. Welcome back, everybody. So, Marin, what's something that you've been thinking about when you aren't writing? A lot of the writing process is not writing, and so I don't want to say that this is process, but, you know, sometimes there's that, that in-between where we're just thinking about ideas so what's something you've been thinking about when you're not actually hammering away at the computer i think about a lot of things which i think is part of the secret of being a writer i'm just fascinated by everything so um uh especially i am a science and and not a nerd um you know nerd but um the other big thing about me is that I'm dyslexic and I, I can't balance a checkbook, right? I am just, the person who tested me said, if I wasn't so smart, I'd be flipping burgers somewhere, right? So I'm not a scientist because I, you know, you need precision and be able to write things in like columns. I can't oh, yeah. do that. Um, hi, Evie, you're so cute. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, and. Evie's butt. <laughs> so, um, but that doesn't stop me from being fascinated about it, by it and reading about it and learning about it and understanding the concepts. Um, speaking of dogs, can you hear mine? She's just yeah, decided to she's, bark. Yeah. Well, I have my dog snoring, yours barking. That's, mine's barking. You know, people yeah, there's, are just going to get to enjoy that. There's probably a deer out there. All right. So I like to read that sort of stuff. And so I just finished a book that's called Why Fish Don't Exist. Um, and I could almost go and get it, um, but um, just Google it. It's... Um, it's a book that's, um, uh, it's actually about uh, the first president of Stanford and his, um, his life, and he's a uh, taxonomist, all right, mm -hmm. so a guy who puts things into categories, right? Um, the, the, but in the very, the title comes from this concept that the category of fish doesn't actually exist, which is what this guy actually was fascinated by. Um, and uh it's the same it's the same line of thinking that says that that we all kind of accept now that birds are dinosaurs right okay that there is no separation between birds and dinosaurs birds are dinosaurs yeah. because ta cat taxonomy is all it for for so long it was just phenotypes right it looks like it right. has the same sorts of things ergo it's related and we're learning now with like dna that that just isn't a thing yeah and so 
the concept with that fish don't exist is uh, you take it, take things, uh, take the thought experiment out of the water. And the thing about mountaintop, okay? Saying all everything that breathes water that lives underwater as a backbone is a fish is like saying everything that lives on a mountaintop is a mountain critter. Um, and, and they all have the same things, which isn't true, right? A caterpillar right. that lives up there is nothing like the um, mountain goat is nothing like the uh, the 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 the, ball, the eagle that lives up there, right. right? But that's the same kind of thing that we've done with taxonomy with fish, because eels have backbones, but they don't have scales, right? Um, carp live in freshwater, not in salt water. That's entirely different. And sharks have teeth, but they don't have any other bones. They're not even kind of technically vertebrates, right? Right. So they're not fish, but we all call. And we're them willing to make that distinction with aquatic mammals. Where we're willing uh -huh. to say, oh, this is clearly, it's a whale. It's clearly not right. a fish. Right. But the other distinctions we are not willing to make uh, yeah. within that, that, you know, large grouping that we've just kind of lumped together. That is right. interesting. I never thought about it in that way. So I love that kind of, that kind of thing, you know, where, cause, okay, we've, we've, we've put things into boxes and now we're like, no, and there's this whole metaphor in the whole book about, he uh this this person whose name i've forgotten him his middle name is star <laughs> he was he had all his stuff at stanford during the 1906 earthquake he had all his preserved fish in jars glass jars <laughs> during the 1906 earthquake and they all fell off the shelves and they were all smashed and they all got mixed up um so there's this whole metaphor in the whole book about about categorizing things and then shaking shaking it up and no we now we have to recategorize everything um and i forget who said it but my one of my professors um in graduate school always used to say that we categorize at our peril mm -hmm. but at the same time we're human beings and we categorize things because that's the only way we can get through life because yeah. you can't think about every little thing you have to look at a thing and say that's a piece of candy i can eat it or that looks like a piece of candy but it's in the cat box and i can't eat it we have to be able to do those distinctions right well, I talk about this. Sorry, I'm looking at almond roca, so that's where that came from. So. Yeah, <laughs> no, and I, I talk about this with my students, and I, I could be wrong about the the you know origin, but my understanding is this was one of Aristotle's big things. Was his big contribution was taxonomy. We mm -hmm. should be understanding the world by putting these things into these categories. But uh, a great example of kind of that bad categorization, he looked at a frog and went, "A frog is clearly a plant. They're both green." Right. And so if you're looking at a characteristic alone and you're saying this characteristic puts these things into the same categories, you create a lot of problems. And I extend that with my students to, you know, this is the way our brains have to work. Like we have to put things into categories to understand our lived experience. But those categories cause us all kinds of problems, especially when it comes to people. Yep. Where we're saying, I've got to put this person into this group. I need to understand them on site. And, you know, evolutionarily, it's because I need to find out, is this person somebody that is in my tribe or not? Is this person somebody dangerous to me? Is this person someone I can breed with? Is You know, whatever. And so we're dropping people into those categories and making dangerous assumptions very yep. quickly, yep. you know, and, and letting the students understand they, they don't need to feel guilty about right. that. That's the way their brain works. They just need to understand that what they're doing is incorrect and they can take a deep breath and they can say these these categories that I dropped this person into are wrong. Uh, I, you know, I did that because that I'm a human and now and I don't need to feel guilty for that. But now I can step back and say, oh, all these assumptions that I made because I need to categorize are split second assumptions that are often in error. Yeah. Um, and I think that's helpful for kids to not feel like, oh, you, you should feel guilty for judging. Like, no, you're you're going to judge because you're a person. Yep. But you can also ignore. What you do that after that? Cool. Right. Yep. It's this. It's the next step. Um, yeah. We we have to categorize. We categorize at our peril, but we don't have to stop there. We can move on to the next one. Yeah. Uh, um, Hank Green has a series of videos about categorizing in language and mm -hmm. uh, one you know for example one of his is yes technically lava is soup uh you know and the ocean is soup yeah. like and yeah. you know and and uh, you know if we define this term in this way then it makes all of these things within that term uh you know and, and so oh yeah the ocean is soup lava yeah. is soup that goes to the is is a uh, taco a sandwich yes uh, that kind of question well it depends <laughs> how we define our terms you know so that, that is, I, those are fun I hadn't thought about how those are good exercises for um, 
thinking about categorizing, but they really are good exercises for that. Um, yeah, any I think anything that forces us to stop and say, what prejudgments did I make? Really anything, this is maybe even a broader statement, but anything that makes us say, oh, I was wrong is really healthy <laughs> because, you know, we live in a society now where, um, uh, you know, it, it, it acknowledging error is seen as weakness. Mm -hmm. It is seen as, you know, and I think there are uh, kind of demonstrable political origins for that. You know, here was a politician who said, oh, I did something in, that was incorrect mm -hmm. and people just ate him alive. Instead of saying, good for you, you can learn, you can stop and grow. And, you know, and and so now people are so afraid to say I am wrong uh, or I was wrong. And what it prevents us from seeing is I am also wrong in the present. There are things right. that I am currently wrong about. Uh, That's and that, that was a that was really eye opening to me. Uh, uh, Wittgenstein has a quote that I, I'm going to butcher, but it was something about how there is no language that has a single verb for uh, being uh, incorrect in the present person indicative. You cannot say, I currently believe something that is incorrect uh, in any language with one word, uh, because that's not a, that's not something that would be meaningful in our brains. And yet, if we step back, we all know we are wrong about things in the present. It logically follows, right? And so how do we force ourselves to acknowledge, I, I believe things that are wrong right now. <laughs> it's really I hard to think about. My favorite kind of example of that to show, show off my nerd cred is... Uh, Star Trek four, when they go back in time, right? And they're walking through the hospital and Bones' head is exploding. He's like, holy crap. And there's this woman in the hallway. He's like, what are you doing here? She's like, oh, I'm dialysis. She's like, oh, you barbarians. He hands her two pills. He's like, take those. And, right. and they walk back through the same hallway later. And she's like, you, it's a miracle. You fixed me. Thank you. He's like, yeah, whatever. And he's like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I, you know, that fun thought experiment is, you know, what are the things that our great grandchildren yeah. will look back on us and be appalled? Yeah, and you know, crap, I thought about that. Right? <laughs> or, you know, it, and it's impossible to know. But, you know, the, the things where we, we talk about, oh, this thing this person thinks is problematic. Someone yeah. will think those things about us where they will go, well, you know, grandpa, he did think this thing, you know, okay. they ate meat. I mean, that's, to... very, that's one of the ones that comes to mind for me. I think, you know, our great grandchildren are going to look back and go, they ate meat. Yeah, you know, totally. That's wild. They ate other you know? animals they ate without other animals asking them. They, <laughs> they didn't need to. Like they'll go, that's, you know, it makes sense that people, you know, in prehistoric times, but when they didn't need to, they kept doing it, you know, and yet I'm not stopping. I like meat. <laughs> You know, delicious. it's delicious. Yeah. Uh, and now that's yeah. on the record forever on a podcast. You know, my great grandchildren will be able to hear me saying I'm not quitting, even though I acknowledge this is probably barbaric behavior. I just told a, tur a tur story about taking three turkeys to their deaths. I put right. them in my car and drove right, them to right. the butcher. <laughs> and we felt good about it. Like, yes. And you donated them to the, you know, the, these people in need. But and other people who couldn't afford turkey could eat the turkey. <laughs> even animal to other people to eat. That's terrible. Yeah. No, we thought of it as a kindness. <laughs> I was like, yeah, <laughs> President Tom Turkey is like, yeah, shit happened back in the day. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so uh, in addition to all of this procrastination, what has been going on career-wise that we want to make sure to get on folks' attention? What, what's, what's been going on with you that uh, that you need to get out there in the world? Oh, goodness. Um, it's kind It's kind of... A, um, feels weird to say on a pro podcast about not writing, but I'm actually quite a productive writer. <laughs> uh huh. Yes, you are. And, and I just did my year end review, which I stuck up on my website. And I actually forgot to put a couple of things on it, even though I thought I was being pretty. So anyway, there's a lot of stuff out there for for people. So one thing that I'm, I'm I've restarted, I got too busy last year and I, I left my I have a Kindle Vela story up and Vela is where they we've serial we serialize a book or a story. And you can get the first three chapters free the first three um, episodes free. And then they you buy coins and you can use the coins to buy the Vela chapters. So I've got I left it hanging and um, uh, Nancy Ballard um, <laughs> really likes the story. Know, she's, yes. been, she's been bothering me for a year. It's like, where are you going to put the end of the story up? I'm like, I don't know. I'm going to do it now. I have time for for reasons, and I have time. I'm just I've got six episodes left, so I'm going to put those up, and so people can finally read the end of the story. Yes, and this is, is the one the about <laughs> dragons here in our roughly our valley. Did you? But you fictionalized our our. Geography. I fictionalized our town, but it's our town. Yeah, yeah it's Monmouth. 
Yeah. Um, and so it's, um, I pitch it as, it's called the Dragons of Mary's Peak. Um, I think you're gonna put the link in the show notes. Yes. And I pitch it as, let me see if I can get it right. Um, Jaws meets E.T. meets Contagion. Nice. Um, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I would absolutely read the heck out of that. That sounds great. Yeah, it's a fun, it's a fun book and it's fun to serialize it and put it on Vela. And it's an old book of mine. I haven't, um, it's one of those that uh, I shopped around and I couldn't get traditional people, traditional publishers interested in it. Um, and, uh, but I ended up having, I, uh, it was kind of cool, the, the uh, Portland State University, I think it's that one, has a book publishing um, degree. Yes, is that, that they run Ooligan Press, right? I believe that's their. Program. That sounds right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, through my connections, um, there was a call for unpublished books that needed book at ed- book editing because they had a book editing class. I'm like, here. How cool! <laughs> and so I got three student editors to look at it and give me ideas on how to improve it. And I'm like, okay, well now I have this and. And I'm still not going to send it out to traditional publishers, but this is a good place, a good home for this with this book. Um, and I think it's a lot of fun. And there's actually a second, uh, I'm publishing the in Vela the first half of the story. There's a second half of the story that if there's enough interest, then I will right. I will fix the second half and stick it up on Vela. Oh, so that's, that's one of the things that's up there. And that is one of the cool features of Vela is, you know, you, you can measure and people are liking this. I can add yeah. too. So totally. That's yeah. cool. And that is the kind of one where, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I could imagine traditional publishing saying this is too regional and yeah. then, oh no, it's taking off. Well, in that case, you know, that's been my, um, I've self-published a couple of different books and used, um, um, uh, uh, non-traditional publishing um including not a pipe but i've also used other other um small small presses because big publishing wants to make a lot of money yeah i just don't want to go broke if i make any money i'm right. happy <laughs> so right. so um so yeah real regional and if i make a little bit of money out of this um then which i did actually vela um was paying bonuses to its its uh, early adopters and yeah i made some money on that and i haven't nice. even finished the darn thing so yeah um i'm fine with making any money and because yeah. I'm, I'm not actually writing for the money ben i just yeah. I, I just write things down and make them nice and then i write another thing that's what i'm really interested yeah, well and, and this is a confession that uh you know uh, some listeners may uh, appreciate and some might find appalling but with you know not a pipe the model is there are a lot of authors out there, I think, who are just like me, who just want people to read their books. Yeah, yeah. And we would give them away for free if that worked. Yeah, um, if it worked. If it didn't cost money to make a book. people don't invest something, they don't read it. Uh, there's, there's a lot of research about that. If they don't pay, they don't read it. Uh, I know I know that's true of me. If somebody says to me, here, I'll give you a book for free. Great. I'm never going to get around to that one. Yeah. Whereas when I feel like I picked it and I invested, I'm going to go back and I'm going to read that book. So a lot of what we're doing with Not A Pipe is just... Let's give someone an opportunity to invest in a book and then read that book because that author wants readers. And so not a pipe, we lose money about every other year. Like maybe we make, you know, it's, I'm certainly not quitting my day job uh, to, for not a pipe. And, you know, there's always the, the fantasy of one of them becomes an absolute monster hit and funds everything else. And that would be wonderful. But in the meantime, I just want people to read the books. They're really great books. So, uh, yeah, you know, Mari's got a book from Not A Pipe. Please read it. It's really good. We just wanted to get it in your hands. <laughs> we yeah, thoroughly yeah. enjoy it. And I yeah. think we may talk a little bit about that one because there is a question from a listener that relates. So, okay. Um, but yeah. first, what else is going on with you? Okay, other things. Um, so I'm restarting my newsletter. People can go to my website. We have links in the show notes, I think, for that. Um, and newsletters are hard. I've got, I've got a good email list um i mean i've been doing it for 10 or 15 years i've got a good email list um especially for someone who, who does this who writes a newsletter as infrequently as i have i have a li- uh, a link to in my in my end of year thing i have a link to my last one that i wrote which was july of this last year um, <laughs> it's, eh. um I'm, but my goal is to do it monthly but i'm relaunching it this year because i've decided that a i need to write more about the books that I'm reading because that's that's you know but the other thing is that I teach a lot of books yeah. and I have to talk about them 
anyway. Right. Um, and some of you might be interested in what I have to say about some of these yeah. old classics, right? So this, this term, I'm teaching a class in dystopian stories. And so I'm going to write about them. Um, like we're doing 1984. We're doing um, Handmaid's Tale. I'm doing Gattaca. I'm doing um, um, Idiocracy, which is, I love that. It, it, every year I'm like, do I dare show it again? Because it, it holds up. It holds up with an explanation, right? Right. <laughs> um, and a whole slew of short stories like the lottery and all this. And so I can write a paragraph on a couple of those each and um, people might actually be interested in that. Oh, right. Yeah. I'll read it. I, I teach a science fiction lit class and we do a mm -hmm. whole unit that's Handmaid's Tale, 1984. Uh, we don't do Idiocracy because at the high school level, that might get me in trouble. Uh, yeah. But we do Gattaca. We do, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, the lottery. Uh, so that would be that would be cool for me to uh, as a resource. So thank you. Okay, you're <laughs> welcome. Be, yeah. yeah. So I figured because I have to because I, I think, uh, you know how your brain is dumb and my brain is like, you don't read enough book. I read freaking books all the time. I'm just teaching. Them. Right. <laughs> so. Right. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, I'll be kicking myself. Oh, I don't read enough. I don't read enough. I don't read it. What did I do today? Oh, all I did was read, read. and teach <laughs> about books. Like, you know, I've read part of the challenge is I'm realizing there are books that I have read, you know, now it's, you know, five times a year, right. every year for 20 right. years. And I'm going, I would like right. to read a wider variety of books than, you know, and so I'm going to be teaching more books so that i'm reading more books uh yeah. so that I, I would rather read a new book five times next year uh so we're, we're we're shifting uh to kill a mockingbird out of the curriculum and we're replacing it i think probably with the hate you give uh because oh, yeah, that's there's a, good one. a lot to plumb in that one uh mm -hmm. and it's far more relevant to my students than a book that i think is wonderful it's a classic everybody should read to kill a mockingbird mm -hmm. but it's a book written by a white woman for a white audience in the 1960s mm -hmm. it's not for my students it's not what they need to read right now and so reading a book yeah. that is really more timely and relevant i think will be uh great for my my kids mm -hmm. and then i get to read a new book five times next year yeah 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 yep 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 um in in the Probably in the spring, I will have. Will I do my hand? Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm going to um, teach my women behaving behaving badly literature class, <laughs> and we'll do Hamlet. I think with that one as oh, well. Yeah, I've taught Hamlet. I can't even count how many times I've taught Hamlet. I because I used to teach it three times a year, every year for like ten years. Uh, I think I have a couple things to say about it. Yeah. And I think I've only taught Hamlet once, so that would be uh, that'd be yeah. a great one to go back to too. Yeah, yeah so I love that play. So newsletter, if you want to see my musings on some of these things that I have, I am very intimately intimate with these things. <laughs> and I'll put it in the show notes so folks can sign up. That's a good right. use of your time. And then the last thing I need to pitch um, uh, is uh, in six months I'm going to have a play that's going yeah. to be produced. And so that's July 5th through 8th. The 5th is a Wednesday. So that'll be our dress rehearsal um, for uh, Apple Box Children's Theater, which we, we talked about a little bit about before. Uh, the play is going to be um, El Principe Oso or The Bear Prince. And I'm kind of excited about this because it's a thing I've never done before. I've adapted a whole bunch of things. But this year we decided um, it's mostly um, Wendy Boyack. Uh, uh decided that we really although it was a thing that i've always i've always thought too we really need to get more of the hispanic um community involved yeah folks um, and, listening from a distance our community is about 50 50 and so yeah. you know the, the representation is not 50 50 and so it much of what we do well, so that's really important yeah uh, one of my my um, daughter my older kid at, at some point had to write a paper about how racism affected her and she's like I'm white. I'm in, you know, it just doesn't affect me. And I'm like, well, okay. Um, how many, th um, theater kids are there in your, in your skin? She's like, I don't know. There's 40 or 50 that show up regularly. And I'm like, okay, how many of them are Hispanic? And she's like, uh, and I'm like, and how many of those people, um, do, are, are in your school? She's like, I think it's 40 or 50%. I'm like, you're experiencing racism here, honey. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. I'm excited about the play because I have written a character who speaks entirely in Spanish, the whole play. 
Um, I have not written the Spanish because I do not speak Spanish, but I have um, resources. I'm going to have a community member. I've got the translation class at Western um, that are going to translate the Spanish bits for me so that, Absolutely. and especially with the translation um, class, because they'll all be young people. <laughs> Well, and, and speaking as somebody things. who is bilingual, I really appreciate that you had the sensitivity to actually get it right. Because oh my god, yeah, let me tell you, there is nothing more painful than sitting there and you know seeing a play or uh, you know whatever, and somebody didn't take the time to right. get it right, and you're just going, oh my gosh, this is painful. <laughs> it's so I am right. very glad. Oh no, totally no, I'm I'm not. I don't. I it. it uh, trying to open doors to it's the other thing that I do with um, the uh, uh, Timberline Review, which is a literary magazine, right, uh, that I'm now emerita. I was uh, editor in chief, but uh, that was one of the things that I had to like back off on. And so now I'm doing emerita. But one of the my main things is like, this is the whitest magazine. It's not the whitest magazine ever, but it's pretty damn white. And I need to open some doors and yeah. I can't make people go in, but I'm going to op do everything I can to open the doors. And that's what we're trying to do here. Um, to show people that we want them right. um, to come and participate. And so I've got one character who's speaking entirely in Spanish. It's going to be an R2-D2, C-3PO kind of thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> Nobody knows what R2-D2 is saying, but everybody knows what R2-D2 is saying. Right. So it's going to be something like that. Um, and Eddie, I'm putting in as much Spanish as I can otherwise, right? Because um, we all know what C means. Um, and we all, and any sort of, any sort of ex, expletive, not swear word, but you know, like, Oh my gosh, or oh hey, or oh I'm so tired. You know things like that that can be yeah. acted out at the same time, and making that in Spanish as well. It's a Mexican fairy tale too that most right. people, um, most people, are just not aware of this fairy tale. It's it's a canon fairy tale though. It's got some Beauty and the Beast to it. It's got a quest to it. It's got I had to invent the sidekicks, but I'm going to do that. So yeah. and this was your Nano Rimo project, right? <laughs> this was yeah. I mean the the idea for it is six months old eight months old and I've done some research, but yeah, I sat down during NaNoWriMo in November to write it. Um, the thing about writing a play though, is that, okay, it's a hundred pages and it's 90% white space. So a lot of white was, space, yes. So that's, I was uh, done in 10 days, so. Um, <laughs> but that's great. I mean, it's great to be able to use that to kind of calendar it out and go, I'm gonna actually yeah. have this done in time. Yeah, yeah, and, and a month later I had a second draft of it and I've got, May I've already sent the second draft to the powers that be to the Wendy Boyack and Jeff Witt and um, um, and a couple other people just to say this is the way that it's the structure is going to be and the scenes are in the right place. I'm tweaking other stuff and I'm translating, but you can use this to start planning the production. Yeah. And so I've got one more draft uh, to make me happy with the characters. Then I'm going to go send it to be translated and uh we're gonna have auditions in april so anyone who's local who has a kid between fourth and ninth grade auditions are in april <laughs> pues, pues especialmente los que hablan español y tienen hijos que pueden uh, hablar en español necesitamos más representación so yes please if you have kids who speak spanish please have them in the play that would be really great for apple Box. yeah uh, we're also working with uh the community members uh to get the outreach so that they know so yeah. that the community knows that that we're doing this and we really, really want them to to come and be in place with us. Yeah, that would be really great. Well, and I know, you know, there's there's the, the kind of classic criticism is people are like, oh, this is, you know, you're 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 doing diversity for diversity's sake. And it's like you, you have to work at it to get to the place where it's not for diversity's sake. It takes an active effort to yeah. diversify, and that is a, a a good in and of itself. So I'm I'm really glad to hear that, you know, doing the pushing to to get get that representation and then after that the next step is more and more leadership from the community involved in apple box uh and you know that that's I'm, where we'd love to get but we first, can always use volunteers yeah. <laughs> so thank you for doing that that's very cool sure absolutely and then also you have books i have books i got three novels for sale there uh, you can go to my website you can go to the not a pipe website and buy our, my, my books i've got sparks which is still my favorite monster under the barn on a horse ranch love story that i've ever written <laughs> every time i describe the book to people they just are, are like oh i i've never known that kind of that myth and they get really excited about it so yeah that's that is that's one we we, we should talk about but we'll get to our one of our listener questions because uh, okay that's a fun um, one. let's see the other two books i have one is 
Um, it's called Closing the Store, and it's about a woman who's a talk show host who decides to run for president and uh, in the process accidentally calls a sex strike. <laughs> yes. It's based on the on the Lysistrata because I like adapting things. And, yes. And that was my very first NaNoWriMo book. And um, and it was a hoot to write. And I still I have one super fan. She works at Burgerville. And every time she sees me, yes. she quotes one of the scenes. Oh, that's great. That is very cool. <laughs> it's so neat. And then the other book I have is called Fuzzy Logic, which is I pitch it as Bridget Jones's diary on an alpaca farm because yes. right what you yeah. Yes. So if, that, if you are a Bridget Jones diary fan or the idea of an alpaca farm sounds fun, you need to check that one out because uh, yeah. br bring those together in your life. Yeah, it's, um, it's, a, and, it's a cute book. And I won't give too much away, but I know that you've also got a, a book that is out with your agent right now being shopped <laughs> that I am really hopeful for. So uh, folks oh, should keep you. an eye out for that, too, because that book yeah. is great. I, I will I will blab all over the place if there's news about that book. But the news is that we're shopping that book. Right. Yeah. Right. That's, you know, uh, authors who are listening know that's part of the process. Like it's got to go through, you know, it's got to get shopped around to various publishers. But uh, when that is available, <clears throat> yeah, I will be shouting about it, too, because it's really fun. Thank you very much. So we have uh, last week we had our, our weekly poll. We do a weekly poll uh, every week. And uh, last week's weekly poll was garbage pile which is the top of the garbage pile was the way that uh our uh Bizakovich, the the guest last week uh worded it and that question in and of itself leaves some you know some room for interpretation but which is the top of the garbage pile mcdonald's or taco bell and so uh the, the results uh, and, and folks please jump in and, and participate in these on on twitter and facebook uh taco bell 25 percent other 75 <laughs> percent nobody thinks mcdonald's is the top of the garbage pile so i i'm that could kind of you know go either way do they mean taco bell's more garbage do they you know but uh i i i admit i was one of the other uh folks because i'm a jack-in-the-box fan uh when it comes to you know what 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 am i going to grab tonight oh so top of the garbage pile as in it's garbage but i'm going to eat it it's the best of the garbage yeah i think that's the way i interpreted it anyway uh so yeah, yeah the, the question leaves some room there um, but bo both uh, B. Zalkovich and I agreed, we do love Taco Bell Quarterly. Do you know about Taco Bell Quarterly? No, what's that? This is a literary anthology that's all Taco Bell themed. It's oh, I've heard hilarious. it. It's hilarious. It is so great. It's, you know, here's a Taco Bell inspired science fiction story. Here's a Taco Bell, uh, you know, a reference to Taco Bell in a fantasy story. And it's a legit uh, literary anthology with a taco bell twist in everything it's so great so folks That's check awesome. out taco bell quarterly um even if you're more of a jack-in-the-box fan uh, than a taco bell fan um Jeez. and so what's our que what should be our question for this next week oh okay so um as the executive producer and playwright for apple box i now am expected to write a play every single year which is awesome for me um because uh, I'd like to do that, but uh, I have to uh, come up with something to write. And it's been a minute. Actually, it has not. It's only been two minutes since uh, I adapted a Shakespeare play. Um, but uh, I thought I would just ask, which Shakespeare play should I adapt next? I have a master's degree uh, in, in, in literature in um, Shakespeare, so uh, I like me some Shakespeare. I've done Much Ado About Nothing. I've done uh, Midsummer's Night's Dream. Uh, which were a lot of fun. Um, and so which of these plays sh should I do next for kids between the ages of nine and 15? Yes. <laughs> um, so and you've, two got, choices. you've got options. You're not thinking Richard III. Oh, uh, <laughs> I really want to do Henry V. I but, think you know. it could be fun, yes. But I like these two. I think this would be... So what are the two that you're considering? The two I'm considering right now are Comedy of Errors, which is one of his first ones. Um, and it's about it's about the two sets of twins that are separated at birth um and the other one's macbeth <laughs> yes which uh i think see uh, you know i i, I won't I, I shouldn't weigh in in advance but i can imagine little kids doing macbeth and it would be amazing like <laughs> i love swords. my mother's womb untimely ripped <laughs> so great <laughs> so so yeah, make that the make that the quiz. See which yes, one people yes. like. You have to find a kid who can roll their R's for that. For, for <laughs> my stuff, I, that's that's the high point. And so my 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 son, you know, 
revealing maybe more about him than he wants to, but my son was born C-section. And so I always say to him, you know, you yeah, untimely. your mother's womb untimely ripped. Um, I've got one of each. So yeah. <laughs> he's, he's pretty sick of that line. Uh, but uh, yes, that's uh, uh, a running gag in our household. Um, so we do have listener questions this week. This has been fun because, uh, you know, for, for the beginning of the show, we're only seven episodes in. It took a while to get to these, and now we've got a bunch. But the first three are from previous guests. So okay. uh, <laughs> these are these are fun. Cool. Um, so the first question comes from B. Zelkovich, last week's guest. Uh, and she asks, how in the heck do you find time <laughs> and inspiration to write in all these different formats? Oh, uh the time question the time question all right so the the, the pithy answer is nanorimo. Mm. um all right so before my first nanorimo, which was in 2008 i was the person who had half a novel done that i've been working on for 10 years yep. all right so then i heard about nanorimo and i decided to do that um, which was a big decision. And I don't recommend people actually do it the way I did it because I did it when my baby was turning one. Oh, gosh. Right? And it was the end of the quarter, right? I was teaching a pretty much a full load at that point, even though I had a one-year-old baby. Um, and I also decided to host Thanksgiving um, and finals were, were coming. And then the last three days, I had the stomach flip and I still finished. Yeah. <laughs> That's, so, a lot. that's an accomplishment so it was it was an accomplishment and i don't so um something in my brain said you're going to do this and i latched on and just hung on and for the ride yeah. uh but ever since then i have realized that when i'm not writing it's not because i can't it's because i'm not and that's a real difference right so the other thing that nanorama did was it taught me to stop being precious about my first drafts. <clears throat> my first drafts are garbage. <laughs> they yeah. are just vomitous masses, right? Order, out of order. Uh, that's one of and the out of order. We'd be floored by if they if they if I could like color code my novels. Like this was the order it was actually written in. It would be right, wild. Right, 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 people right. would be like, really? That was when you started? Because they, yeah. they do not end up where they begin by any means. Right. And the writing's just bad i forget the colors of people's hair and eyes yes. all the time and <laughs> I had a character um, they name. jump from location no. to location like they have teleporters it's just garbage but as long as and i use a double bracket the square bracket because you don't have to even hold down the shift key you just bam bam and it's like figure out what color his eyes are bam bam and then go yeah. on i write as if so i can pound out rough drafts um because then i can fix them and i'm one of those weirdos that likes editing um, and I can fiddle with a thing forever. Um, I, have, I, have, I have figured out when to stop. You know, when I we realize I've changed the comma back and forth yes. more than once. I'm like, okay, I'm done. Um, <laughs> um, but not being precious about my first drafts was a game changer yeah. um, because I could just pound out and I can make it pretty later. I just need the story. I, I tell people it's like, um, like a potter, right? Someone who works with ceramics, they start with a lump of mud. If you don't have a lump of mud, you cannot make a beautiful vase. So I get the lump of mud out as much as, as fast as I can. <laughs> Do you use the strategy, which I learned from our mutual friend, Kate Ristow, of putting brackets yeah. and just saying, you know, I'll need description of this later, <laughs> you know, or whatever this person's name was. She's great about that. Every once in a while, one slips through into the, right. uh, the, <laughs> the manuscript I see. And I'm like, oops, you forgot that one. But yes, it is. Uh, it's, it's, it's a good strategy. You don't want to slow down and go what you know so she'll go whatever this person's eye color was i'll find that later right one of my favorite authors is murray lafferty and she routinely puts in brackets insert fight scene because she hates writing fight scenes yeah. so she's like insert the fight scene and then she goes on her mirror yes that's... so the, the and the third thing that nanorimo taught me was how to steal time and mm -hmm. how to make time um, well you can't make time there's only so much time but you can schedule time yeah. like i have a writer acquaintance who uh, just marked himself busy during lunchtime and he'd close his door, eat a sandwich and write for an hour. Yeah. Yep. No one yep. missed him. No one bothered him. His calendar said he was busy. So they scheduled meetings around it and he got an hour of uninterrupted time to write every day. So I do, I do crap like that. You know, there's an hour between 
when my office hours end and when I have to pick up the kids and I go to a coffee shop and I sit down and I open my computer and <laughs> I write out my garbage or edit my things, right? Yep. And that, that I found is really key too, is that the kind of geography of I am going to be in a different space. You know, that's, I've got my study. This is a place where I do writing and work. And that's, you know, that's what this is for. And it took, you know, not everybody has the, 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 luxury of having their own space a space in their home or you know being able to afford to go to a coffee shop or whatever i understand that but uh if if you can manage to find the time to find the space that is really uh vital it's super nice i and i don't need a different space because one another thing that multiple nanoramas have taught me is that i can sit down open my computer and just start writing I don't have that stare into space. Oh God, what am I doing? And I don't have to get through all of that. Now it's a habit. If I sit down, open my laptop, I can start writing. But that was a habit that was formed um, from NaNoWriMo, from an artificial deadline. NaNoWriMo is just a play. It's just a way to trick your brain into doing these things, right? Um, and it's, uh, but it, it, it formed a habit of sit down, open computer, write. So I can do that anywhere. Um, it's harder to do at home because I have two kids and they're like, mom, I need it. I'm stuck in this. There's a room and <laughs> I'm hungry, but I can do it at home. Right. Um, I like to separate it, though. I know some people I knew. A, I knew a writer who actually had different hats. Oh, yeah. Right? And he would put on a hat and he'd write. And he's like, well, now it's time for editing. So he take that. He put his editing hat on and then he'd do his editing. Yep. Um, well, you know, whatever it is that that does it for you. Right. I know Kate. Uh, Ristel, for example, she handwrites everything, her yeah. first drafts, right? But she has a tablet that, that she writes on. Um, so if she's handwriting, she's composed, she's composing. If she's doing this on her computer, then she's editing, yeah. right? However, your brains are funny and tricky things, and something will probably kick your brain into doing the thing, uh, whether it's being in a certain space, whether it's having a different hat, whether it's just the habit of like, oh, I've got five minutes, I can do a thing. I've got I've got I've got notebooks stashed everywhere. So if I'm waiting in the car for the kid, I can like steal time that that. So I steal time. Um, yeah. Brittany, <laughs> inspiration is not a problem, though. Um, yeah. No, I, that yeah, that, that's always uh, cracked me up. People will say, you know, where do you uh, where do you get your ideas? Do you ever worry you're going to run out of ideas? And I'm like, oh, no, I worry I'm going to run out of time. I've got more ideas than I could possibly ever get down on paper. And, you know, you just, that, that's not the problem. In our little news segment, that you know, the, how many right. stories did we come up with with just the things that were just blipping on our radar from yeah. the news? Yeah, I'm there's... never going to run out of ideas. I am going to run out of time. Although, although I tell people when they ask me where where I get my uh, ideas, I say, well, you know, you know that place that that hidden alley where Harry Potter got his wand. Yeah, it's right next to that. Yeah. <laughs> That's where yeah. the idea store is. But there is an infinite number of things in that store. There is <laughs> it's no problem. Uh, with the... Also, I mean, you know, look at my background here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, so yeah, that, that's, that's not that's, fake either. I could, yeah. I could pick one of these books. I oh think. yeah, I was, you know, as you were talking about uh, uh, something earlier, I was reminded of the book uh, "Scatter, Adapt, and Remember," and uh, which I highly recommend to folks. Oh, and it's okay. you know science. It is you know uh, futurism, uh, and yet within it, there's a, a thousand possible stories of what these futures could look like. You know, so yeah, there's there's never a, a, an ending to, uh, to 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 that. Yeah. Um, of course, I say that, but then I'm also thinking about what should my next novel be, and I'm like, uh, but it'll come to me. I'm not worried. Exciting. About it. Yes. Which of the it's ideas? Matter of yes. sitting down and wiggling my fingers around, and then, or looking at the number of lists that I have taped up everywhere. It's like you should write a book about this. It's one of those. Yeah. One of those will spark an idea. Yeah. Well, and I've got like four. You know, my next novel after that will be my next novel after that will be kind mm -hmm. of lined up, and by the time I get to them, I'm like, oh no, I'm not excited about that one anymore. Right. But uh, yeah, I've got plans way out for uh you know uh, how many the, the books that i want to write yeah finding, finding the time is a challenge you know and so yeah blocking out the time in that way and saying this I is when i will get this done i had a new writer that i was mentoring who had edited it was in an infinite editing loop for her book yeah, that's dangerous yep right and uh she told me that she'd sent it out to a couple of editors and she'd done this and she'd done that and she was and I'm, and, and i i finally said i stopped stopped her and i said is is this the only book you're ever going to write and she's like well no i was like is this the best book you're ever going to write and she's like well no and i was like 
I think maybe you need to stop yep. and send yep. to places yep. and go write another book. <laughs> That's, and I, you know, I'd say that with authors with, for the company, you know, is the, the best marketing you can do is write a better book, yeah. which is a hard thing to hear because you're like, but I wrote this amazing book. Yep. And the next one is going to sell this one and the one better. after that. But right now you have one product to sell people. And that's hard because your close friends bought your one product. And uh, so what can you do now? Write a better book. And, and then, then your backlist book will sell. Right. Yeah, somebody's going to come back and go, I just discovered you and I love your first 19. So write a better book. Uh, but that's that is that's a hard, you know, I understand why that's a hard thing to hear. <laughs> you know, like Because uh, you, you, you love the book you wrote. And I do too. That's why I published it. But now you need to write a better book. <laughs> like, yeah. And as for the formats, um, I'm not faithful. <laughs> Which, um, you know, not as, all as a... ideas are going to fit, right? My mother's a music teacher and she put it really well. She's like, there's a reason why there's music and art and impressionist art and abstract art and writing and poems. And it's because we're trying to express this thing. And some things are only expressible with this form of art. I can't write a novel that is Beethoven's fifth. Right. I can and maybe. From a marketing perspective, I'm supposed to tell you uh, as your publisher, just keep writing the same thing over and over and over and over and over because that's where the money is. But that's not where we are as artists. Like yeah. I, I am the worst about that. Every one of my books is in a different genre because that's what I'm interested in doing. Whereas, you know, the people who are making the money are churning out, uh, you know, the next mystery that is very similar to the last mystery because that's what their fans liked. So when you're bored uh, sometime, yeah. you know, uh, all the museums have digitized their entire collections, right? So go pick a famous artist, uh, especially one that is like, um, oh crap, what's his name? Uh, not Kadinsky, um, uh, uh, Miro. Let's do Joan, Joan Miro, all right? He's the one that does the, the, the ball, colored ball with a line mm -hmm. and then he makes the mobiles and it's completely abstract. Go look at what he was painting when he was 15, when he right. was 20. Right. And he's this, this, this draftsman, this beautiful, realistically rendered paintings right nothing like what he's done because as artists we evolve right right and yeah but i also you know can think of examples of artists who painted the same painting a thousand times and that was how they paid the bills you know and, uh yeah what's his name the uh, uh Kincaid or whatever Kincaid. Was, yeah you know and and you know hey that's a choice people can make but that is not me like i whatever, just can't keep know? writing the same book over and over i want to try something different i want to try a different point of view and a different genre and you know every, everything's going to be new and so yeah. from a financial perspective it's a terrible choice but it's <laughs> it's an artistic choice um so our next question comes from another previous guest evan morgan williams Aww. and his question was Yamas with an exclamation point. <laughs> <laughs> so llamas, tell us about llamas. Oh, I don't know much about llamas except they're bigger alpacas. Bigger um, alpacas, although, right. Yeah, there you go. There uh, you go. Uh, llamas are, if you think of them as Peruvian donkeys, pack animals, and alpacas are Peruvian sheep. So, um, But even llamas don't uh, hold enough to hold a person, yeah. right? Their spines are not. They, they are used for pack animals but you little people them. maybe <laughs> no yeah. and, and <laughs> up so to they're, about they're... 75 pounds or so maybe yeah. 100 there's maybe some 100. really interesting kind of historical analysis speculation about you know the the inca empire was really wonderful uh, in so yeah. many ways but was it this real strategic disadvantage because of something that was totally outside of their control the spaniards had horses and they had llamas mm -hmm. and you can't ride llamas uh, and so they developed way. these elaborate road systems and communication and yet the communication had to be done by people on foot right uh, they were faster than the llamas yeah yeah, yeah. Um, it, the horses are yeah and it Anyway, it's another thing that I've I've thought about that, you know, their horses, there were here, but but they died before people learned how to ride them here. Yeah. And and yeah, it's yeah. So so yeah, alpacas are I could talk about alpacas for another hour. They're just so cute and so fascinating and so interesting and tell you all about um I mean uh, so with this story uh uh fuzzy logic, um basically everything that happened to the woman who started an alpaca ranch happened to us you know i've been elbow deep in an alpaca fishing out babies i've been <laughs> i've abs I've, I've i've cleaned out abscesses every day for months i've pulled yeah. teeth i've done all of this stuff right um nitty-gritty farm stuff 
Um, and also, you know, I take a chair out and sit in the field and read a book and they come up and they're like nibbling on my pages because they're like, what you doing? What you doing? Right. Curious, um, curious. So they're like cats. I realized about 10 years after having them that they don't like to be petted, <laughs> which is really disappointing because they're so freaking cute. They're, they're, they're ticklish. They have guard hairs and they're just ticklish. And so if you put your, it, it's, it's almost like um, an autistic child, right? You can't brush a, right. an autistic person. It just, it's just, but you have, you know, firm, steady pressure and that's comforting. And it's the same sort of thing with, with alpacas and, well, and other. That's good to know. Like, you yeah. know, just hand placed is better than petting right 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 i will Sorry, remember that. that so yeah i can talk about alpacas forever they're just they're so cute and we did shows for a while and all of this fun stuff um yeah but <laughs> are, been... are do you have some that are spitters and have an attitude because that's a real thing right that's a real thing i've only ever been spit on um they only aimed at me if i'm doing something to them they don't like um, I had one that used to chew on my head whenever I would I would uh, like weigh her baby or give it a shot or something. She'd come over and she'd just gnaw on my head. Um, or I was given a shot or taking a temperature or something like that, right? Um, or shearing them. I had We had one that we had to put a sock over her nose when we were shearing her because she just, just sprayed it everywhere. Um, so if you antagonize them enough, that is a form of defense. Most of the time when I get spit on though, they're spitting at each other and I happen to make mm. eye contact by accident. <laughs> you got in the way of the fight. Right, exactly. Yeah, I was, I was collateral damage is what I was. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the walls of our barn are all covered in spit. And it's just it's just what they do. Uh, <laughs> and it's they don't like to spit. Um, most of the time when they spit, they're just kind of making the noise so that you duck. Right. Um, if they actually load up and, and, and land one on you, then yeah, nobody's happy. Um, <laughs> Well, that brings us to our next question, which comes from a previous guest, Karen Eisenbray, who asks, are there any more monsters under outbuildings? <laughs> and we should uh, contextualize this a little bit because yeah, that's yeah. what the novel Sparks is about. And this is when, I, when I'm when i kind of explaining this book to people, I'll say to them, you know how when you're driving down the freeway and you see a barn on the side of the road and it's falling down? Well, there's a reason for that. And I didn't know this. Uh, so let folks know the kind of backstory of that book. It's so yeah. great. This is, this is it, it comes with a, um the territory of, of doing things like farming you meet people right and one of these other alpaca farmers that i uh bought some alpacas from uh was at his place and this was of uh, how long ago it was one of my uh, i had brought one of the kids i don't remember which one and and, and she was in a swing right <laughs> she was a year old or something yeah. and we're walking where he's giving me the tour of his place and he's this old farmer dude old old farmer dude and um his family had settled on their property um in one of the first waves of settlers that came to oregon right um white settlers right. <laughs> qualify this here um and we walk past this old milk barn which was attached to the other barn right and milk barns are these low um they're they're just there it's just a shed for the 10 or 12 cows you have to mm -hmm. come in and, and you milk them and they eat some grain and then they go out and then you can like hose it out. And this thing had been there for 150 years, something like right. that. And it was falling down. And he says to me, I just wish that old milk barn would just get over and fall down. It's really dangerous for the kids. And I, like an idiot said, well, why don't you just tear it down? He looked at me like, like spiders had fallen out of the sky and were crawling over my face. And he's like, because it's bad luck to knock down a barn. I'm like, oh, yeah, of course, it's bad luck. Yeah, yeah, because I don't know. I was still trying to impress him or something. <laughs> um, and um, then I drove away and I never circled back to him and asked why. And so I asked that there, there's um, more people that show up in the book are the Liars Club, which is the, at yes. the cafe. I love those a whole characters. Bunch of old retired people. <laughs> old men who come at the, you know, when the cafe opens six, seven o'clock in the morning, have coffee and tell stories, right? And um, it's my coffee shop. And so I asked them, hey guys, is it bad luck to tear down a barn? And half of them were like, oh yeah, totally, you never do that. And the other half were like, no, that's total BS. I'd never heard that story before. And, but none of them knew why. And so I started doing some research. Um, I got, I roped my, roped our friend Kate into the research because she's a folklorist. Right, a pro, yeah. Right. And as near as we can tell, it's a Scandinavian, um, it comes from a Scandinavian um, 
folk tale, I guess, about barn about uh, sprites that protect livestock. And if you're good to your livestock, then the sprite has no problem with you. It might even be helpful to you. If you're mean to your livestock, then bad things happen to you because the sprite's mad. And so from that spark, from that original story about the barns falling down, and um, and from the idea of a sprite, I came up with the idea that the sprite came over with the cows, attached itself to some cows that somehow got transported to Oregon, and then he made his home in the cow barn, the milk barn, and then there weren't any cows. And, but where is he going to go? <laughs> so um, that's that's our um, that's the cow sprite in in the um in sparks which is a monster that people need to read because it is not you hear cow sprite and right. you don't think yeah. about this truly this terrifying is... potentially terrifying mm -hmm. monster like it's yeah. really cool like i, I just, it just came out so well so Thank yeah you. and then it's within the context of a, a very much a romance like here is yeah. a story of these two people meeting they've got complicated histories and traumas of their own how are they going to get together and also there's a cow sprite that may kill them. And yeah. so it's so, yeah, check that book out. It's really wonderful. Yeah. I, I well, love that one. Sprite is definitely a misleading term. <laughs> right, it sounds cutesy. This yeah. thing will kill you. It's scary. And so that's, uh, I, I, I love it. And I then our fourth question comes from somebody who has not yet been a guest on the show, Dale Olson. And so I guess we're going to have to have her on the show. Like she's just basically, you know, uh, uh, earned her 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 ability to, uh, to 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 be a guest, whether she likes it or not. Um, yeah. Right. And she's a writer as well. So perfect. Uh, so I'll have to reach out to Dale. But uh, great question. She says, which Shakespeare play do you plan to adapt next? Right. Well, it's partly partly going to be uh, based on the, the poll we just had. Uh, but um, I do want to adapt a Shakespeare play into a novel. It's, I've never quite done it. Um, and, but I've been reading a lot of, of other people's, uh, works. There's a great one that came out a year or two ago called All's Well, which is, um, not exactly an adaptation, but the plot of the play heavily, it is it's a play it's a book about putting on the play but it's also about it also in the play and it's got other plays to get it's got the three witches from Macbeth except they're old drunk guys it's it's great and I'm going to read Hamnet which is one of those that's that's been on my periphery it's just mm. not hasn't risen up to the top yes. of my red pile um because he, he one thing that he could do was uh he could do lots of things but he could plot like crazy yep. Yep. um and I love adaptations because it I'm just a smidge lazy and not, and, and I have written, um, like for instance, um, um, the first two novels that we talked about. So, uh, closing the store and, um, and fuzzy logic are both adaptations. Yeah. Um, cause I adapted, uh, Lysistrata and then I adapted, um, Pride and Prejudice, which is what, um, which is what, um, um, it flew out of my head. What's that called? <laughs> oh, fuzzy logic. Fuzzy logic. Yeah. Um, um Bridget Jones is based on oh yeah that's on, right um, that's right Pride and Prejudice right so um Sparks is actually one of the first books that I wrote without adapting something yeah. uh, the other one is the Dragons of Various Peaks that's one that that was that I created whole cloth but I like adapting it makes it so that I can focus on characters and settings and right. and other things that I'm interested in I don't have to worry about is this plot gonna work because I got a plot that works yep. um and I want to do, I'd like to do a redemption of, um, of uh, Taming of the Shrew, right? Mm. See, so, that's what I was going to say is one of the things that an adaptation allows you to do yeah. is say, I love Shakespeare, but I'm going to fix the parts that are problematic. Yeah. Uh, because yeah. there are parts that don't translate to our era. They are. And right. in fact, I think we could both agree should never have been unproblematic. Like, the, you know, <laughs> and yeah, I mean, is problematic. The way in my mind, I redeem. Uh, Taming of the Shrew is that I am, I tell myself the story that um, the two of them, Petruchio and Kate, 
are in cahoots at the end. And that's the way. So I've got a friend who uh, is, uh, you know, Tony Award winning uh, set designer, uh, the theater guy. Uh, and he uh, was involved in a production of it and is also very knowledgeable about Shakespeare theater. Uh, and it drove him crazy because that's the way it's often done now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the, they did this thing with this really cool rotating set. And so in the big fight at the end where he is inarguably in the text beating her into submission they rotate the set around and you see that they're both participating in it and they're in on the act and then it comes back around and you know we as the audience get to go oh we're in the know that this is not this horrible thing that's happening and my friend joel was really frustrated because he was like on the one hand i understand why we have to do that on the other hand we're not showing the play this is not what shakespeare intended this is a much darker it's a grim story he does beat her into submission it's pretty awful and so uh you know i i i respect his faithfulness to uh shakespeare's vision and at the same time you know and he understood as well we can't do that play as that play was written now it would be really offensive and awful for folks yeah uh, to and see Kate, that. So our rewriting allows us to say, no, this really is the way that my version goes. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, and it's the same thing with The Merchant of Venice, which, yes. you know, Portia is fantastic. And the way they treat Shylock is awful. Yes. And inexcusably, in indefensibly anti-Semitic. There's no way around it. That, I mean, yes except that and when i do happen to have to teach or to discuss this play the one way you can sort of is that shylock's character has every reason to want a pound of fesh, flesh oh yeah. yeah every reason it's just There's the you know the 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 adding that religious valence cultural valence then you can't escape the anti-semitism right. like you know right. and that was totally acceptable in shakespeare's day and oh, you know in london at that time and yet we need to say and it shouldn't have been, and it never should right. be. Like, that's awful. And so the, holding those things in tension is really challenging. Yeah. I, I had this, I so I rewrote uh, The Tempest as a science yeah. fiction novel. Such a good book, yeah. It is, but Miranda is an object. Like, the, she is not given any agency. She is married off as a, she, she is tricked and kind of used as a test. And then she doesn't get to do anything other than be married off to kind of make this connection. And so that was one of the things that I got to play with was how can I really go out of my way to make her do something at the end so that she is in charge, not just of answering this test question for her father, but then gets to do something about it. Uh, and so that was fun to get to fix something that I thought was a fundamental flaw of the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Shakespeare's women are so fascinating it's like the ancient greeks the ancient greeks you know uh as a society women were treated like chattel right the playwrights respected the crap out of women and they yes, more were, than the society did yeah and so yes yeah and it and i have this feeling that shakespeare had a similar point of view Mm -hmm. because comedies everyone has to get married at the end that's what a comedy is that's how you resolve the romantic status uh breaking of of the status quo you can't have two people in love running around right. before there's adequate um birth control right you just can't right. do it um and so they have to get married at the end that's not a thing that has to happen anymore yeah. and so i um well, you know, Shakespeare is a mystery. We can paint him however we want. He's dead. He doesn't really care. Um, and, um, you know, in my mind, if Shakespeare were alive today, he wouldn't have to write those plays in those ways. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And so, um, and since he did, he's dead and he doesn't care, I can at least pick up some of those things and play with them, right? Yeah. So um, it's weird. I don't have quite the confidence to do it yet. I've kicked around all sorts of of uh, ideas for these things. Cause I'd also love to do uh, Merry Wives of Windsor. That's not one I don't think I can do for the kids. <laughs> no, that would be for grownups, but would be great to have that. Oh, and, I love that place yes. so much. One of the things um, I think is really fun about it is to reset it in a different setting. Mm -hmm, uh, and yeah. so, you know, you know, that's why I did the sci-fi kind of AI right. version. And I've thought about 
continuing that uh, and doing, a, you know, another kind of science fiction version. One of the things I enjoy about Christopher Moore's uh, versions is he'll take a character from one and now that no character problem. is in the next. So Fool is pretty strictly uh, um, Lear, uh, right. Lear, and then the next so one is two then plays, is... but with a character from Lear, and the next is three plays, but with characters now from, you know, and so I like how he's kind of expanding this uh, Shakespearean, uh, uh, you know, c cinematic universe. <laughs> Fantastic, and I just love what he did with um, with the, the Fool character, whose name is Pocket. Yes, uh, so great. Love him so much. Another uh, one I'll shout out there for folks, if they like rewrites, is uh, mm -hmm. uh, if you like the idea of a science fiction retelling, Hamlet done as a science fiction in a future where there are no human actors anymore the actors are all androids and this android is trying to recognize whether or not it has become self-aware is it independent of the part it has to play and so you've got hamlet played by a robot trying to figure out and do i have to be hamlet which fits perfectly with hamlet so the book is called two two solid flesh and it is a really, you know, and so what happens is the scientist who makes the robots is also sleeping with the robot that is his mother and ends up being kind of the Polonius character. And then Hamlet as the self-aware robot is trying to solve the mystery of his robot father's death, maybe at the hands of his maker. And so it ends up being, it's a, it's a really wonderful way of thinking about artificial intelligence and robots and also what is this existential question that hamlet is forcing us to ask about mm -hmm. are we playing roles right. uh, and are we stuck in our roles so two two solid flesh worth your time that's a good one i have an outline for a book that's based on love's labor's lost because it just it's it's a rom-com it's oh, yeah. just a total straight up rom-com and it would be so much fun just to like, throw those people on an island somewhere and <laughs> well, that's what I was going to ask. Where would you set it? I don't know. The island thing just popped in my head, but it kind of needs to be the, the the part of the thing with the play is that they're constrict they're confined in an in a, in a in a castle, and um oh yeah okay this this I ideas never go away so okay it's a mix uh, this is how I'm going to pitch it it'll be love's labor's lost on an island um but it'll be like love is blind um <laughs> it's set in a reality well, show or you could do like on a cruise ship. Like they're right. isolated in some way, but in a modern way. And that could right. be really fun, you know? Oh, we're gonna, you know, you could do the whole, uh, um, oh, who was the author who wrote, a, uh, you know, an absolute, uh, a supposedly fun thing that I never wanted to do, <laughs> ever want to do again. Okay, uh, yeah, totally. Yes, oh, that, you could, that you know, piece is so good. <laughs> they're, they're on a cruise ship. They're stuck on this awful cruise ship experience. And then it's Love's Labor's Lost. That would be a kick in the pants. This crap writes itself. I mean, <laughs> the, the Shakespeare guy knew what he was doing. Like, I have to tell my students all the time, he was not writing stuff for us to analyze in a classroom. He was writing blockbuster films. Like, he wanted to sell tickets. And so there's a reason why they're fun and they still work because totally. they're designed this is pop entertainment there's total art in there but i've counted like 40 fart jokes and hamlet oh, yeah. all by itself so. yes exactly <laughs> well and i i really do believe that our shakespeare is lin-manuel miranda like he mm. is the person who's working on all those levels where he is, this is too, fun yeah. for everybody and also it is deep and it is lasting like and it has mm -hmm. got these levels of talent and mm -hmm. whether it's animated by pixar or it's on broadway lin-manuel miranda is doing that multi-layer shakespearean yeah. I'm, I'm i'm making a big hit and it's yeah. you know so yeah i think we will look back he, he's gonna last his stuff is gonna stand the test of time because it's popular and brilliant mm -hmm. <laughs> you know so contacts where can fi folks find out more about you and follow you and keep up on all this stuff well um i'm all over the internet and i've been there for freaking ever so um um uh so you can find me on facebook i have a an author page there which is um marin bradley anderson um it, and that's that's my public profile there and i stick stuff up there that's all um about my writing and then random i really like dad jokes and puns so be prepared. Yes. <laughs> um, so that's where that stuff comes uh, goes. I'm on Twitter and Instagram at, at Marinster, which is like monster, but with my first name instead, M-A-R-E-N-S-T-E-R. Um, I am not on Twitter a whole lot anymore for a reason. So I'm, I'm also on Mastodon. 
And if you go to Mastodon, I'm at Marinster at OHI, which is O-H-I-A at uh, that social. So O-H-I-A dot social. And we will link to that in the show page as well. Yeah. So folks can see that there. And I'll pitch Mastodon just a little bit. It's kind of fun. It's kind Are of like- doing it? I, I have not spent enough time on it. I, you know, was when Twitter was- you know, it seemed the collapse was imminent. I, I got on uh, yeah. Mastodon, I got on Hive, uh, but I've not been on them enough, you know, because Twitter didn't totally collapse. But yeah, uh, yeah so I'll, I'll make sure to connect with you there as well. Yeah, I'm keeping Twitter um, because I have so many contacts with so many right. people on there, right? Um, and it's still the big one. But Mastodon's kind of like Twitter was 10 years ago. Yeah. It's just kind of charming and, and people are... Um, are nice to each other there and there's just not the level of um vitriol there's a word that is the opposite of charming that is twitter yeah, that's what twitter <laughs> is yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, and i have a long discussion about how i sanitize my facebook and twitter feeds so that they make me happy um and they're not they're not but um that that's a discussion and of course there's my website too which is uh um www.marins.com m-a-r-e-n-s.com um Good that shows you how long I've been on the internet. Is that yes, that you were able to get that one. That's good. Um, okay, so we better wrap up here. I've got a lot of folks to thank. I want to thank uh, artist Max Oakland, who reached out and provided one of his songs for our intro song, I Prefer the Dusk. Take it. Uh, let Max know you like it by following him on Twitter, at Max Oakland. Uh, and thanks to Halizna CCO for their song Kids for the ad break. Thanks to Doug for putting that all together. Hi, Doug. Um, yeah, thanks, Doug. We appreciate all of your work. Uh, uh, can't forget to mention Writers Not Writing is a production of Not a Pipe Publishing. So please go to notapipepublishing.com and check out the amazing books written by writers who didn't procrastinate too much. If you like this show, rate and review it wherever you found it. And please rate Marin's books. Uh, it makes a big difference. Yeah, it does. Um, yeah, we, you know, that that's, I, it's a hard to overstate how much that matters to us as writers. Um, even a short review, click that fifth star, make somebody's day. So, uh, Marin, I'm going to let you, I talk too much. I'm going to let you have the last word. How should we do our send off for the show? <laughs> Only 11 months until Christmas. Get shopping now. Be like my mom. <laughs> <laughs> if I take